So may I just ask a quick question? Yes. I, I completely realize how sometimes, you know, uh, certain towns need prior take priority and, and a rep or a senator needs to advocate for that. But in any way, does, is are we representative, is somebody being put on the back burner? How is that, how is that kind of determined? I'm sorry, I was, who would be put on the back burner? Well, another town in some way, or in terms of what Thetford's getting, re maybe repeat what exactly is happening uh, in the town of Thetford. Okay, my, my under, and I don't know the exact situation, but my understanding is that um, <coughs> there is a- um, Hello, are you there? There has perhaps been a proposal, uh, I don't know if Chuck can answer because I don't know the exact situation. Okay, but what this basically does, town or not, it's similar to everything else we've done for towns, recognizing that some towns uh, have enough broadband access to do Zoom meetings and public meetings via Zoom, and other towns are less gifted. And we have given towns extensions to almost everything, regardless of which town asks for it. Got it. And mm -hmm. I don't think we should get into the specifics. It's going out to all towns. It just gives every town the right to request an extension on the time that they have to get back. And I assume that, Helen, this is, is this one just the COVID emergency? Yes. This is yes. the one that is yep. just during this emergency. The and to, to ability respond. to put up temporary facilities is any emergency. So if there's a hurricane or an ice storm or other things, right. then that go, that's for, any emergency it's forever this one is Perfect. covid specific and it is similar to what we've done almost everywhere else <laughs> right uh um, allowing towns more time um allowing them to do things remotely um so that's i think regardless of yeah. which town you know, got a letter in saying, you know, we can't do this in this time frame. Thank you. To respond directly to Senator Campion's question, I, I don't believe that it disadvantages any towns. I think yeah. it provides the same no. opportunity for all. It's not where anything gets placed, no towns getting right. put on the back burner. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then, uh, so section two is was existing. That's the report on 248 yeah. criteria. No changes there. Um, we agree on the report. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we knew you'd like that. Yes, that's progress. Okay. Um, so then going to section four, which is where I think both of our committees have gone round and round and round. Yep. Um, and so what we really focused in on was um, what is it exactly that we want to know? We want to know when there's a failure of connectivity. And it doesn't really matter what the cause of it is. Um, we want to know if people do not have the ability to call 911. So rather than talk about backup power or uh, subscribers versus a provider's backup power, or anything like that, we said, if it's a, uh, if there's a lack of connectivity due to, that, that is the, uh, due to the telecommunications providers network failure, if your system is failing, you need to report it. Um, one question that I asked did show that there are still, it's not a perfect solution still. I, I asked the question, so if, and I'm picking providers at random here, but if a VTEL tower loses its backhaul, but the backhaul is actually owned by First Light, I said, who is responsible for reporting that? And the answer was perhaps nobody because it's not 
VTEL's network failure and First Light isn't failing their customers. So that's an area where th this, uh, this ambiguity continues to surface. It's, it's not entirely resolved, um, but we felt it was uh, getting away from talking about what the failure is caused by and having a long list of qualifying things to just notify us of a failure in your network. That's what we're looking for. I think we were looking for the same thing. Uh, let me say the backup power, that mm -hmm. was also a town specific request. Yes, it was. Um, it probably took longer than anything else in this bill. Um, the, the question, I think we all want to know when there's an outage. The question was, what is it reasonable? You know, how long an outage and how long do you have, you know, how big an outage? The thing was thus, it was a half an hour and something blows off a tower. It takes a half an hour to get a truck up there. You fix it, in, you know, 10 minutes and it's fixed. By the time it's reported, it's fixed. Um, and there are national, you know, for the national reporter, uh, for the local guys, you pick up the phone, you, you call 911. For the national people, they didn't have a system set up for that. They are set up for the, um, the national system. And I believe we delayed our start time because California is looking at making the reporting for the national carriers more granular. And rather than have Vermont be an outlier, we thought as we frequently do, we'd ride California's coattails since they have a lot more people than we do. Right. So that's... Um, and, and this is, so we were um, silent on what those thresholds should be, whether they should be California's thresholds or whether they should be Vermont specific and leaving that to the E911 board who stated- They've already her, put out a rule. They put out a rule which has not been- um, Passed. Right. Because it's been waiting on this bill. Right, but their thresholds were were clear. Their their preferences for the thresholds it's gotten clearer. Yes. Um, All right. And uh, the the twenty five subscribers for thirty minutes is an existing threshold for the old copper based landlines. And so what E nine one one board was doing was extending that rule to all telecommunications rather than having different thresholds based on different technologies. Okay. I think one of the questions that we looked at at the time was at least from what we heard uh, from some of the larger uh, providers who are using the federal standard is that this will require the creation of a standard that is unique to Vermont among the states. And there's a cost associated with that. Now, we can certainly make large providers pay cost if we're getting a benefit from it on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, there's the potential of those costs should rightly be passed on to Vermont ratepayers if that's the case. In my mind, one question is, well, once we get the information, what are we gonna do with it? Uh, having the information is great, but if there's nothing that you can do with it until we've thought that through, that's one potential problem. And given where we are with COVID and so on, the likelihood of our moving extremely quickly is not great. The second question is the California provision, as I understand it, goes into effect on July 1 of this year. And so we will have something to look at uh, pretty quickly. So one question, at least that crossed my mind is in the House's proposal, it was to uh, take the date to September 30, 2020, 
And what would the, how would the House feel about simply extending that to July 1, 2021, when we'll have the ability to look at the California uh, standard and determine whether or not that's something that we can do right away anyway? Um, I, I don't feel that I can speak for the committee on that, um, but our thinking on the September date was that that would give, um, that would give time for the E911 board to uh, modify and uh, reintroduce their rule, time for LCAR to respond. And then that rule gives the uh, telecommunications providers six months to um, achieve the, the, the reporting standard. So it's not something that they would have to start on uh, September 30th. But it, it gives them time to implement a, a strategy to reach that. Um, and I think that if it became evident that they could not do that, or if there were prohibitive costs, within that six month window, the legislature would have time to, to look at this again, January, February, or March of next year. Said September, 2020. Correct. So is the rule. The, uh, the not E911 board shall file their, shall submit their proposed rule by September 30th. And then the rule says that from the date the rule is adopted, tell, uh, providers have six months to meet those reporting requirements. Thank you. Um, one of the possibilities, if we can't reach agreement on this, mm -hmm. since I think we all agree the 248A extension has to happen. Does it? Is that everything could get stripped out, except that. Because um, I, I just, we're, we wanted to do a committee of conference. We were told things wouldn't make it through by July 1st if we did that. So we're trying to make sure that what has to go through goes through. Um, but we, we've got a couple of new proposals here that we haven't seen. And um, I think we need to, and we've got very little time. So we're gonna work on it and try and get it done. But that, that is a possibility. So I, I would like to see a, a committee of conference personally, and I believe that- uh, That was my first done. instinct, yep. <laughs> that we could yep. all sit down, but I was not encouraged by yep. leadership to do that. So, so I, we're working I think this out it, this it's way. True. It's true that the, the must pass piece of it is the 248A sunset. Yeah. Um, if, if we don't, pass, other parts of it are, can be sacrificed if necessary. Um, but what I would hate well, to we see- We can work on those in August, but um, July oh, 1st is the drop yeah. dead. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I would hate to see the, the E911 rule just hang indefinitely as well. Also, yes. Okay. Committee, any questions at this point? So, so Madam, Chair, Madam Chair, you heard from leadership. I'm sorry, go ahead, Senator McDonald. Just, I'm, it's the industry has been asking for the extension of the sunset, right? Yes. No, the sunset dies. The way, yeah. the 248A is the expedited way to put up poles and wires. What we've been told is it if we don't extend it, that every pole and wire we put up or cell tower will have to go through Act 250, which means if we want to get broadband out with COVID money before the end of the year, we've got a real problem. That was the issue that... Well, I've been, we've been, it's been suggested... Industry that, wanted us to just yeah, do away I, with the sunset altogether. Right. And, and, 
I'm shocked. Right? But the we've been it's been suggested that the reporting is going to cost some more money to the owners of cell towers, and it's troublesome. Um, I, I got to you know I understand there's a cell tower that's being proposed in Chelsea you, that you got isn't two being, different. Two no, different no, issues no. confuse Senator. The two forty eight A is one thing. Yeah. The um, reporting outages times is another. And when cell towers fail to communicate, the bill would require that notification be made so fire departments or schools or whatever. No, to the nine one one board. So 911 is unavailable when the tower goes out? Right. Yeah. So they have to report it to 911. Yeah. The problem yeah. is once 911 knows, there's nothing they can do about it except tell the fire department, watch for smoke up there. I mean, there, there's no way the local EMT knows I'm having a heart attack in my house if I can't call, even if they know my cell phone's out. Like, this was for our information. Yeah. We want to yeah. know how much of a problem we have with outages. But the solution is a duplicate system, which could be very expensive. So this is basically- Well, I, I was bringing up the notion, Madam Chair, of duplicate systems, because my understanding yeah is that AT&T is proposing a tower in the Chelsea area and not doing the co-location that our policies call for. And maybe Chuck will tell, tell me that I'm wrong because I'm often wrong, but talk about duplication. Um, is, is the same companies that are worried about duplication on the issue of nickels and dimes are perfectly free to duplicate when it gets into you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I, 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 you're losing me, Senator. Whether and if actually it would be better for 911 if they weren't co located, because if one tower went down, there'd still be another tower. Touche. Okay. I mean, the problem is they're all on one tower. And when that one tower goes down, everything goes down. Um, so that's, you know, and, and it's, we're trying to figure out a way. First, we need to know how big a problem we've got. Then we have an idea of maybe what it's worth to fix it. Um, but this is right now, the reporting is information gathering. Um, and just to be clear, uh, the E911 board is doing the rulemaking because they were instructed to do so in Act 79 last year. So that instruction is still uh, hanging over their heads. Yeah. Well, I think that's when we first started getting information that it did go out, it went out in some places with some regularity, but we didn't know how much right. or how often. And I think that's what we're trying to find out is, is this an issue? Um, and does some other tower pick it up? Well, on my cell phone, maybe another tower picks it up. There's been stories about that or other fire departments getting the call, but Okay. So, Madam Chair, any yeah. other questions, Senator Campion? Thanks. So, if we're not going to have committee uh, committees of conference, it sounds to me like perhaps the most important part of this amendment from the House's side is Section Four. Is that accurate? Wouldn't think so. Um, I I would say that the 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 number one priority, as your chair identified, is is sure. something with the sunset. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the the next one would be the clarification in section four that allows 
E9101 rulemaking to be completed. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mm. And we could ask for a committee of conference. I thought having us all sit down in the same room and have this discussion might work. I was discouraged from asking for that. Okay. So we're taking testimony. And hopefully um, we can work that out. But can, we, can we have a it committee just, of a breakout room on the side? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we like can just call it a breakout room and sit down and talk. Sounds like the non-bank bank. You could have a non-committee of right. conference I, committee of conferences. Right. I think they're really dis the leadership is discouraging committees of conference on all sides, given that most things, all things important, are supposed to be finished up in the next two weeks. And committees of conference can drag on. So um, I said we would give this a try. If it gets really bogged down, we can ask for a committee of conference. And at this point, it looks like we might have to take a Saturday or an evening to all sit down. And actually, Saturdays are starting to get filled up. So um, I and don't really get out. that our differences on this are at all substantial. I think they're relatively minor. And I think that that, that uh, a discussion, whether in the formal committee of conference or an offline discussion, uh, might be able to resolve the major differences. Uh, although, you know, we have to obviously, you know, talk about them as a committee. Right. But mm -hmm. I just don't sense that we're that far apart at all. Yeah, no, I think- Ma it Madam was, Chair, had, yeah. I, I thought I heard Senator Brock volunteering to uh, be an emissary to the House Committee for us. <laughs> uh, my connection could be shaky. Okay, he might be. No, I, I mean, there were seven. Get Senator Collimore to be a referee. There you go. <laughs> we get, uh, now there are several new sections in here and they were new to us. Um, I think today we're just trying to figure out what they mean. I don't know that we disagree with them or not. There was some concern about that you know, do it, giving emergency powers, but then giving the town twice as long to, to respond. But I think we've gotten that, you know, that information. Um, so we'll see where it goes. Well, and I'm certainly happy to, to come back as is helpful, participate okay. in any way, whether it be a, uh, a, a, a breakout room <laughs> <laughs> or further committee discussion. With a referee. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to go on to Commissioner Tierney. Okay, Commissioner, I gather that emergency power was at the request of the department. So why don't you tell us what that's about? And I guess my concern, I, I actually said it might work for your barrage balloons because they're temporary, but I can't see someone putting up a tower. I suppose maybe a cellular, um, and and this, you know, maybe something attached to a pole for the short term. But um, and we really haven't had any testimony on the Northeast Kingdom project, but it keeps getting referenced. So maybe you could tell us what that is too. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think uh, you've pretty much put your finger on it. This is intended to help in an emergency. It's a regulatory gap that exists right now. As our Representative Chestnut Tangerman said, there is a, a comparable provision for uh, transmission and distribution utility facilities under emergency conditions, but nothing for telecommunications. And what I had anticipated uh, when the COVID emergency looked as like it was going to result in an order for people to stay home was that there might be a need for emergency telecommunications deployment. So in March, uh, I had suggested to the administration that we try to get something going to close this regulatory gap. And the language that you have in front of you today is uh, very much a product of a lot of hard work that uh, House Energy Technology did 
over the course of a couple of Friday afternoons that I attended as well. And you're quite right, it doesn't contemplate the rapid deployment of towers, but there are a variety of um, infrastructure elements that can be deployed rapidly and temporarily where there's no regulatory clarity that they can be deployed right now without some input from the PUC. So this uh, language uh, creates that clarity. One of the things I encountered when I put out the um, April 10 call to action to the utilities to do what they can to help with deploying emergency telecommunications was uh, the uncertainty about whether they could put up a pole, for instance, uh, in order to site a, a, a radio or the like, or uh, an antenna or, or uh, infrastructure of that nature. And there was some reluctance to proceed without that regulatory clarity. On the industry side, and, and Chuck Storrow can speak to this better than I can, there was a flat out um, hesitancy, if not a declination, to proceed rapidly with tower deployment if there wasn't some means of ensuring that in due course, what was done under emergency circumstances could be reviewed for permanent siting. So uh, in my opinion, uh, the work that House Energy Technology has done is necessary work, but it's not a big uh, step. It's, it's closing a gap that exists in our statutory framework. And to, to be clear, the, the extension that I was confused about earlier uh, pertains to protecting towns when uh, a carrier seeks a 248A CPG during an emergency. And that's different from seeking to site emergency. Okay. All right. That makes it clear. So someone's going through the regular process. Precisely. 248A. They this would sense. allow the town. Precisely. Going through the normal, not the emergency process to have longer to get everything together. Okay. Right. And right. that makes it more in line with everything else we've. Done, that is COVID specific. Exactly. And, uh, and as I remember now, that wasn't anything we were discussing when I was visiting with uh, House Energy Technology. So I got my wires crossed and I apologize to Representative Chestnut Tangerine for uh, breaking in on him like that. I did not mean to do that. Uh, in any case, um, I'm happy to answer questions for the uh, committee uh, about this. That's why I asked to testify today in case you had any questions. Uh, I, my heart sank when you said that the only must pass piece of this bill is the, um, the sunset provision. I can of course see why the committee sees it that way. But from, from my perspective, as you well know, Madam Chair, the, the window for expending COVID money is rapidly closing. And this is a tool that would be helpful for us to have in the toolkit. I, I'm not in a position to speak to the details about the NEK project, except to say that it is something that has come together rapidly uh, to help a lot of students in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, it's been a, a shuttle diplomacy effort, uh, courtesy of uh, Velco and, and uh, the department and uh, the Northeast Kingdom wireless folks. And it's, it's very promising, but it may require the deployment of a pole here and a pole there to get it off the ground. And so this uh, provision today would, would help with that. Any questions? So you would see this right on in there with the, well, the 248 just expedites the process of getting any poll up for right. the next three years. But to do this emergency power, we really would need both, um, I, th I think. But yeah, during this emergency, you're probably right, the ability to put up emergency um like an extended pole say a pole that's above 50 feet for instance yeah or a, a monopole that goes up uh, a significant altitude those are the kinds of emergency things we're talking about and uh the other the the 248a versus two, act 250 thing i i should add that uh, the department supports that as well the sunset piece um because i think the the progress that we have made in deploying telecommunications infrastructure in the state has largely been owing to the efficacy of 248A. 
So to have that die at this point would not be a good thing. And I, I think Mr. Faber will speak to the issue too if you ask him. So. Okay. Anyone have questions for the commissioner? You have questions for the commissioner, Senator McDonald, or are you not hearing something? I know I, I was having a little trouble hearing the commissioner. No, I, I had trouble hearing you. So. Me? No one has trouble hearing me. Okay. It's technical. It's technical. It's not you. Okay. All right. Um, any questions at this point for the commissioner? Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, uh, next on my list, I've got Chuck Storo, Charles Storo. So, Chuck, it's yours. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Chuck Storo, Leonine Public Affairs, here on behalf of AT&T, um, here to just uh, give you uh, our clients' uh, reaction to the House's changes to S301. So I'm going to be referring to the House's version of the bill. Okay. Um, in Section 1 of the bill, the House uh, shortened the extension of 248A sunset from five years to three years. As the committee will remember, I was arguing that the sunset should be repealed altogether and the, and the statute should be made permanent. Um, you know, it's always possible to amend or repeal a statute without there necessarily being a sunset in place. Uh, so we, you know, view the uh, reduction of the extension from five to three years, you know, as not being a good thing, but three years has been the track record right along for extensions. Um, you know, we will take what we can get. Three years is pretty good. You know, be happy if uh, the two chambers split the difference and came in with four years. Uh, but uh, as long as it doesn't go below three years, we're good. Um, the House also put in, in that bill section one, the emergency waiver language that the department was seeking. And uh, I don't know how much at and would take advantage of that. Certainly for one of their larger towers, it'd be probably pretty unlikely uh, because there is always the possibility that if you can't get permitted after putting it up on an emergency basis, you'd have to take it down and the company doesn't generally wanna run that kind of risk. Uh, but there may be other providers with smaller installations that this would benefit and since it's not anything that hurts us. We're fine with it. Um, the, the next part uh, is, yes, the report on the criteria. There's no change there. There's no problem with that. Uh, bill section three in the House's version is this uh, ability of a town to seek an extension of the 60-day pre-filing period to 90 days uh, before a company like AT&T can actually submit an application for a 248A permit to the PUC. It has to have provided a draft of that application at least 60 days in advance of, of submitting it to the PUC. Uh, AT&T routinely uh, extends that period. In other words, it doesn't uh, on day 61 slam in an application. Uh, more often than not, uh, it's engaged in productive conversations with a town to try and come to an agreement. And if additional time is needed, there's no problem. We routinely will provide that additional time. There was a little bit of concern about it being a sort of a, a mandatory feature, something that the towns could get because there is a federal shot clock uh, that requires you know, a time limit on the overall processing of these types of applications, but this section does not run afoul of the shot clock. So uh, we have no objection to uh, bill section three. Um, the main issue from our perspective, aside from the 248 a um, sunset is uh, section four in the house's version of the bill. Um, as passed by the Senate, that section instructed the E911 board to revise its proposed rule and get it back to car in September uh, with the federal NORS reporting threshold being applicable to um, um, wireless providers. The House has taken that out 
uh, and presumably that would mean that the board would just go forward with its current proposal that any outage on the part of a wireless carrier that lasts more than 30 minutes would have to be reported. I submitted a, a proposal to you committee members and I also gave it to the House committee members uh, earlier today for sort of a middle ground. And this does relate to the California situation. Um, California is working on a rulemaking, an outage reporting rulemaking uh, proceeding and they're under a statutory deadline to get that done by July 1. Um, they have taken a round of comments, but because of the COVID emergency, they have not been able to uh, complete the, or they're anticipating that they're not gonna be able to complete their rulemaking by July 1. So they have therefore uh, adopted uh, on an emergency basis, a rule that will go into effect on July 1. And then presumably after they've considered the comments, you know, there may be a change in what they, they're putting into effect to reflect uh, the, the comments that, to the extent that the California rulemaking authority agrees with them. So that made me think, well, what if the E911 board was instructed to adopt the North standard uh, as the reporting threshold for wireless carriers, but that <laughs> You'll laugh at this, but then that provision is sunsetted uh, on July 1 of next year. And by default, the rule would then resort, revert to what the E911 board is currently proposing as a rulemaking threshold. And my thought there is, is that, um, you know, the dust should be settling on what California, where it's landing for its uh, reporting rule and that would give if if the current e911 board's proposal is held in abeyance for a year that would give the legislature an opportunity in the 2021 session to take a look at what california uh, did and uh, if there's agreement that maybe uh, what they did would be good for vermont and that then the board would be instructed to adopt that <coughs> If the, if the legislature didn't do that, didn't take it up, then the matter would be on autopilot and the board's standard would go into effect in July of next year. My sort of motive in all of this is that while the wireless industry isn't necessarily thrilled with what California is proposing, uh, California is gonna adopt something. California is a big state we're not gonna leave the market in California because of what it adopts, we're gonna comply with it. And that being the case, uh, it would be better uh, for us if we don't have to comply with three sets of reporting thresholds, the federal one, one for California and one for Vermont. It may be that it would be the federal one and then a common threshold that's common to Vermont and, and California. So that's the idea. Um, I see Rep Representative Chesnut Tangerman there. I don't know if the, his committee has had a chance, I doubt they have, to take a look at that, but I offer that up uh, as a sort of middle ground that seems like a reasonable way to proceed to basically give California an opportunity to do its thing and then look at it and then potentially follow it. And if that doesn't work out, well, then Vermont's going to do what it, it what it's already proposing. Um, I will say that in the grand scheme of things, the 248A extension, because it, we are close to July 1, is important. Um, the E911 provision is important to us, but I don't want to jeopardize the Section 248A extension over further wrangling on the E911 rule if... Uh, the House is certainly, if it's just dug in and it's not amenable to what I'm proposing um, or anything else that the Senate may come up with. I will say, and you'll hear from my colleague Dylan Zwicky in a moment, there's a fix in the E911 rule provision for the VoIP providers that everybody's agreed to. And if uh, in order to make this bill move forward, uh, things have to be jettisoned. Uh, I would uh, respectfully suggest don't jettison that fix because everybody agrees to it and it's actually necessary. 
from a technical point of view. I think what I've heard is the house was interested in being able to get the E911 rule, which I assume contains other things other than this reporting requirement and get it moving. The Senate was concerned about setting up a separate uh, requirement for national carriers um, and having them have to do something special for Vermont. So we were interested in extending in some way until California made a, a move. And then um, we were told it was more granular than the national move, um, rule. And that, you know, we would look at that and then see if that was something we could latch on, just trying to give um, some consistency. Um, Madam Chair, may, may I yeah. respond to that? And then we're in a roll call vote in the House. That no, I need then to you go. better go. Uh, You're so, a um, Primarily, so when we talked about what the threshold should be, um, our committee was was adamantly opposed to the, the NORS threshold as, as far too broad. Um, in Vermont, uh, as, as Barb Neal said, if a tower serves a thousand people and the threshold, national threshold is 900,000 user minutes, that would mean a tower serving 15, uh, a thousand people would have to be out of service for 15 hours before it would be require reporting, um, which is just nowhere near the kind of thing we're looking for. Um, and uh, so, so we were very opposed to the, the national threshold, looking for something much more appropriate for a rural, sparsely populated area. Uh, California's proposal was uncertain and the, the, both the, at that time, the thresholds and the limitation, the progress of it were uncertain. Uh, so we thought we would go ahead with our own, which mirrored the requirements for the copper landlines. Um, I think our committee would probably be open to a discussion about the California rule. Um, that's, that's, I can't speak for the committee, but just, um, I think we should, uh, I think we would be open to that. Okay. And maybe we can ask Ellen, if she, I think Ellen's here, I see her name. Um, there she is. If you could do a little research for us on the status or basically what is being proposed in California, or maybe it's Maria. I'm not sure who. It's Maria? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, I need to leave. Okay, to yes, you go vote. Thank you. Um, and uh, I think, okay. Hey, that, one other issue that, that I would suggest that we look at if we can, and uh, I'm not sure that Ellen will have the ability to do that. Chuck may be able to provide some of the information, but my understanding is that when you apply the NORS rule uh, uh, of how many people are covered by a particular cellular tower, it differs depending upon where you are in the country and what the population densities are, and you get very different results. And so it's not a, a rule that's simply based on towers, but it would be interesting for us to better understand what that would mean in the event that the California rule were applied as to how many people would be covered by a tower in Vermont. Also, when a tower goes down, whether or not we typically have a single tower or whether we have multiple towers. And again, whether it be AT&T or one of the other, or, or several of the other providers, that's a question that we could ask them. Mm -hmm. Oh, Senator, one thing I would like to, to just mention is, is that um, the original legislation from last year was flawed with respect to the issue of VoIP providers yep. reporting. That has been fixed, and the fix that the House has made is what everybody agrees should happen. The board is going to be under the House's version and under the Senate's version too. The board is instructed to make that fix 
and submit it to LCAR in September. So the rule is going to be, and I would urge you to, to stay that course with respect to the BOIP issue. So the rule is gonna have to come back to LCAR in September anyways. I just wanna make that point that it's, it's not gonna go be able to go into effect or it shouldn't go into effect in July because it, it needs this fix. Um, so um, happy to answer any questions, but I, I would propose that that the wireless reporting threshold be NORS until next July. And then at that time, if nothing has changed, it would go to what the board is proposing. All right, because right now it is the, the national. There, well, right now there's no Vermont specific reporting right. requirement. So, for right, so it would be maintaining the status quo for a year while. It would be, it, well, there'd be a little bit of a change because what we're fine with being obligated to file with Vermont E911 board when we file with the feds. Yep. Right now we don't even have to do that. Now you don't have to do that. Okay. But we're happy to give, you know, when we file with the feds with respect to a Vermont outage, sure, we'll file with Vermont. The House didn't think that the federal threshold was near enough. There's activity in California that would require a fairly granular, granular reporting threshold, basically an outage lasting more than 30 minutes affecting half of a zip code. That's what they're proposing. Uh, and if that's where they land, well, we're going to have to comply with that. And it may be that that's granular enough for Vermont. Maybe not, okay. but let's see. That's the theory. Okay. Can you check with Senator Brock who said he understood that there was some variance based on size of the state density is Actually, it a one size fits all at the federal level or is it there is one size fits all at the federal okay. level? And that's why we think actually NORS is good because it treats urban areas the same as rural areas. Uh, because we don't know how many people are on any in any given tower. Uh, it's mobile service. Uh, so we don't know. And there's no wire going to anybody's phone. So what the federal rule does is you basically take the number of your customers and divide it by the number of your towers and then you say same you know same number of customers is imputed to every tower in the country but it would require for a or would allow for a single tower outage for not to have to report for 15 hours but doesn't that mean in effect that a tower in an urban area and a tower in the in a rural area are very different in terms of the amount of people involved. Right, and they get the, that's right, Senator. And but they get treated the same. In other words, there but, could but be yeah. what it would mean for reporting for us. For us, it might mean a number that is materially different than a number, say, in Massachusetts or New York, and that number of customers would be much much lower. Right. That, Potentially that's right. No, it's that's that would be likely in terms of actual numbers. Yes, uh, but because we don't know how many people are using a, a, a given tower at any time, there's this basically this mathematical exercise that just attributes to each tower the same number of people across the entire country. So it takes but your in point of fact number of people on a tower in Manhattan. It just common sense is not going to be anywhere near the number of tower on that same tower in Franklin, Vermont. I think there'd be okay. way more on Manhattan than there is in yeah. Franklin, Vermont. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, okay. But, but, but I guess my, my thought is, is that California is gonna do something. It's a big state. We're gonna have to comply whether we like it or not. And it would just be easier for us that if we have to comply with California that another state that does this have a similar threshold. So then we're not, you know, looking at different, right. that's, that's all. And, and since that's not resolved yet in California, I'm proposing, give us some, have some time before the Vermont specific, the current proposal kicks in. And in the meantime, we would provide reports to Vermont 
when we have to provide them to the feds. Okay. Um. So that's the idea, and I and I did uh, send it to the committee, uh, the House committee members this morning, and uh, you know if they and I could follow up if they're fine with that, then good. If they're not, and it, and I don't want to cost the bill over this. And I think to Senator Brock's point, we may have more towers per capita because of our landscape. I mean, we're not Missouri that's big and flat. We're Vermont, so we have mountains that get in the way, which require more towers. Um, but yeah, you're right. You, so what they do is they take the number of towers and divide it by- Well, so let's say if you have- a national standard. They say nationally, this is how many people. Yeah, if you have a, a, a national carrier that has 100 million customers, okay. and I can throw out that AT&T has around 140 million customers. So 100 million customers, and let's say it has 100,000 towers. That's 10,000 people per tower, regardless of where it is. Right. Then you just figure out how long does it take 10,000 people to expend 900,000 user minutes? That's 15 hours for one tower. But if two towers are down, then you cut it in half. Okay. Three towers are down, you cut it by two thirds because 10,000 per tower, you know, then you got 30,000 people. Yeah. Well, how long does it take to expend 900,000 user minutes? That's that much less. So that's it's why we argue for the numbers. Yeah. The NORS standard we felt was adequate uh, because most of the time it is multiple tower outages, uh, but the house did not agree. And so now I'm trying to say, well, if we're gonna do something different than NORS, Basically, let's see what California does and then either do that or Vermont will do what it is currently proposing. Okay, I'm gonna get on to Dylan. Thank you. And thank you. Um, okay, Dylan. Thank you very much, Chair Cummings. Um, I will be brief. So uh, for the record, Dylan Zwicky, Leon on Public Affairs here on behalf of New England Cable Telecommunications Association or NECTA. <coughs> Uh, NECTA's issue is separate and distinct, though it's, it is also in sec uh, section four of the bill, um, and it's separate and distinct from the wireless reporting thresholds that uh, my colleague Chuck was uh, just chatting with you about. Uh, essentially, both the House uh, committee and your committee uh, made some changes to uh, the language in, se uh, in section four dealing with the definition of an outage. Uh, and specifically, our request has been consistent that um, an outage be at the reported at the network uh, level. Um, this allows for uh, clear and concise reporting requirements across different um, providers, whether you're retail or Comcast or Charter, um, and that, that those providers are going to be required to report when they actually know that there is an outage, which they, are, they know when there's an issue with their network. Uh, so uh, really, I think that the, the House changes uh, provided some additional clarity above and beyond what the, what the Finance Committee provided earlier this year. Uh, as Chuck uh, noted, it was agreed to by all parties uh, significantly. The, you know, it was actually suggested by Mr. Gibson from uh, Shrewsbury. So I think you'll find that there's a consensus on this language and we, we feel it works well um, from the industry perspective and we'll also uh, ensure that uh, we are clear on what we're what we're what we need to be reporting on. Okay. And any questions for Dylan? I'm not seeing anybody. I'm assuming I've got everybody on one screen. Okay. Greg, Faber. Yes, Madam just, Chair. Uh, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to check in because it had the Public Utility Commission waiving certificates of public good and just wanted to give you a chance to speak. Okay, um, I'm, just gonna, I'm just here to talk about sections one, two, and three. Um, section one, um, we continue to support the elimination of the sunset. Um, however, 
as long as there's an extension in place, that will work. I got to say that the uncertainty surrounding the sunset every couple of years um, causes a lot of problems for us in processing the applications. We get gluts of app applications, as you, as you can imagine, once the sunset um, approaches is there, and there's uncertainty about whether a new sunset will be imposed or whether the sunset will be eliminated. This causes a lot of problems for us, but as long as the sunset is, um, as long as there's some sort of extension of the sunset in place, we're okay. And we'd rather see no sunset at all, but um, if it's three years, five years, uh, you know, whatever, as long as that passes before July 1st, that's, that'll be, that's our main, uh, our main concern. Uh, the emergency waiver uh, provision uh, put in by the department, that, that's fine. We're, we're fine dealing with that. Uh, the report, we're still fine with that. Uh, the, the the notice period, you know, we're, we're fine with that. So, so right now there's an advance notice, what we call an advance notice period that the um, a, a provider will um, is required to send to the towns and the joiners and all those folks um, a, a basically an advance um, notice of, of that they're going to file a petition with us, the commission, uh, at, at within 60 days and that's a minimum of 60 days so they could file they could file on day 61 they usually do not they have up until 180 days to file that a, a 180 day window in which to file that application with the commission once they file the advance notice with the town and everybody else um what this does is it says to the town you can seek a waiver on top of that 60 days you can ask for another 30 days to negotiate during the advance notice period. Now, as, as Chuck Storo said, um, uh, typically the, um, the providers, um, they want to have the town on board. So they're willing to um, take the time to negotiate with the town. Um, however, you know, that being said, I have no problem with this additional 30 days. Uh, I would like to see, and this is more to Ellen and, and Maria, I would like to see a reference to the section in which this notice occurs, because there are a lot of notice provisions in the in the uh, in the uh, section uh, 248A. There's a there's an advance notice period, then there's a regular notice period once the commit once the uh, application is filed. There's different notice periods for um, different types of applications. So if there could be a reference to 248A section subsection E, that would be helpful if you're going to put that in. But that's that's a minor. That's a minor change. Um, okay. As far as section four, I, I don't have any comments on that. Um, and, Probably and yeah, wise. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't want to stay out of that one. Uh, so yeah, I, I just want to stress how important it is to get the sunset, some sort of sunset extension, passed prior to July first. Because I, I think we're all hopeful we're going to reach agreement. Yeah. But. We have two options. Uh, one is to strip it all out and just do the sunset. And the other one is the final option we always have with stick it on the budget. <laughs> yeah, either of those are fine with me, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, so so there you go. There, there's, there's my testimony. I'm happy to take any questions. OK, I think we know that that extension has to go, especially if we want to get any kind of expansion up with oh, the yeah. COVID money. If this, um, goes, if this goes from a statewide level review to a town by town, or if it reverts to a town by town review from a statewide level review, you're not gonna see the pace of expansion that we've had in recent years. Um, it's, it, you're just not. So, um, so there you go. I'm thinking that's pretty slow. Uh, so, yes. okay. All right. So that right now, is the uh, testimony we've got on 301. Is there any other, we got some decision points, think about it. The big one, it sounds like up or down on almost everything, except what do we do with the notice period? That's gonna be the hardest one. I assume if we just strip it out then it falls to the rules 
as they've been put out. Um, or we, you know, can delay doing anything for a year and leave the federal things in place, or we can try setting a separate state standard, which I don't know that it makes any difference to the national carriers, which separate state standard. It's the fact that there's a separate state standard for well, for either one of them, it's less than 500,000 people, probably a couple, you know, maybe not even 100,000. So um, we shall go on, um, unless there's Senator Brock. You muted. That's just one question. In terms of what we've heard today, uh, the I know from my perspective, I don't have any real issue with with much of anything in the bill other than this notice requirement. And I wonder if uh, the possibility in sort of an informal conference committee, if we could modify uh, section four on the uh, that that the legislative committee on uh, administrative rules to propose a, a rule on or before instead of September 30 to put it July. Uh, 1, 2021. I, I think that would satisfy the issues that the carriers have raised. I think it will keep us on track to, to get this done. It will give us sufficient time at the beginning of the year because I'm hesitant to do it on the basis of six months after September 30th because again with the likelihood of a you know COVID resurgence at the beginning of the year and so on again I think we'd be faced with compressed time frames and the fact of the matter is in terms of what we're going to do with this information which I think is really thing that, that will drive a lot of it. We're not doing anything with it anyway, even if we had it. It's true. Yeah, this is right now, it's information collecting. So, um, Senator Brock, can you drop me an email with that? And we'll see if okay. maybe we can set up a mini meeting um, via Zoom. How are you, how, how's your schedule Monday morning? I have, I have all the time in the world, Madam Chair. <laughs> Everybody who's calling me one I, one. I just want a few hours away from the Brady Bunch. Not that I don't love you all, but. Okay, I'll send you a note. 12 hours a day is starting to wear thin. Okay, so we're gonna go on to Lauren Glenn Davidian and Lauren uh, sent us written comments. Um, I told her we were really short because we do need to Get, um, I try and get them out at 3.30 on Fridays. I may not make that today, but I um, want to give her some time. Um, the local access bill came to us. It was a study. We sent it over to uh, appropriations because that's where all studies go because they cost money. Um, I know they're trying to find some COVID money in there, but uh, this is perhaps a little, you know, this is a, a future. Um, so Lauren, floor is yours. Oh, you're, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Lauren Glendavidian. I'm the executive director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy. And I also <clears throat> represent the Vermont Access Network, which as you know, is a mutual aid society of 25 public educational and government access channels and community centers across the state. <clears throat> I wanted to, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to testify. I thought it would be beneficial to provide you with a little um, insight from um, someone who's been in the Zoom galleries watching the discussion about the broadband emergency funding um, and how these issues tie together from our perspective both as you consider the House um, bill, the CARES um, Act relief um, funding proposal that is gonna come to the Senate and also as you look ahead. So this is really just, um, it's an overview, but there's also a couple of appeals in here to you directly. 
So um, the House looked at the needs of the public educational and government access centers um, through the COVID emergency period and the work that we have been doing to support communities. And um, they were very generous, we think, and, and insightful to include our operating and staff costs associated to being able to stream and provide technical assistance to municipalities and other organizations and individuals to be able to participate in using online interaction. Um, they were not able and they did not see that our capital costs were eligible. Um, and it seems that there may be a window to consider those capital costs in the recommendations from the CCG group that they made to you in the CARES Act relief report that they submitted and you heard testimony on. So we would just like you to keep this in mind as you review um, the bill from the House and the recommendations of the CCG group and perhaps consider um, helping us to cover the capital expenses related to supporting the community during this time. So that is sort of request number one. Um, Okay, so the next um, thing is that I just wanted you to be aware because this is an ongoing conversation of the impact of COVID-19 on the state's PEG community access centers because um, I think it's just important to understand. Um, the first is there is a pretty precipitous decline in non-cable revenue that these community media centers are experiencing. Um, Many of them have started, as you know, to diversify their revenue through earned income and philanthropy. And um, a lot of those revenue streams, which are meant to offset cable revenue declines and also make us healthier organizations, um, we, we're anticipating about a 75% decline in that this year, which is about a quarter of a million dollars. <clears throat> We also know from the trades and from Comcast's own communications with its um, shareholders that there will be a dramatic decline in cable subscriptions around the country and we expect in Vermont. So we think that that may be as much as 10% this year, which means about $700,000 of the roughly 7 million that subscribers pay towards PEG access. So those are just two points of information that I think are important for you to know in terms of the general context of the funding world for these services. Um, the next thing that I just wanted to underscore is we are very appreciative that this committee, Senate Finance, voted out our request for a study of um, how to assess public benefit from the use of the rights of way. And as you said, Madam Chair, that is in um, the Appropriations Committee, and they are certainly struggling with many difficult decisions. The discussion of broadband and extending broadband to every home in the state, um, or at least to the uh, students, the households where there are students that don't have access, really raises the issue of the importance of looking for ongoing and regular revenue streams for this kind of public access, whether it's public access to equipment and cable lines or to broadband. And so we think that S318 is really critical and this study is very, very important at this time. And we also think that the mapping requirements for mapping where broadband services are, broadband infrastructure is actually to be specific, um, is a very important requirement of this period of time. Um, it is the only way to have a clear map of broadband infrastructure, fiber infrastructure, which we do not have in the state. Um, we need to have that picture. So the decisions about potential policy implications and also where to deploy fiber um, can be made easily and quickly. And then finally, I just wanted to draw your attention. Um, this is, I think this is just an important point to make, which is in the House's um, bill, the Get Vermonters Connected Now provision of this coronavirus emergency funding, um, 
it talks about line extensions, cable line extensions, but in the house version in energy and technology, the language about the installation of temporary Wi-Fi hotspots or, um, well, it, it, in essence, the installation of temporary Wi-Fi hotspots to expand broadband capacity was X'd out of that bill. Um, and it just really seems very short-sighted to exclude this as a solution, fixed wireless. So I just want you to, I just want you to know that it is short-sighted to um, exclude <laughs> fixed wireless as a way to get broadband to homes across the state and that the line extension solution may get us some of the way, but without these Wi-Fi hotspots of high and low frequencies to reach people in different parts of the state, um, we are really, I think, um, precluding the options that will help solve this problem. And I also, you know, I understand in the background that there is, um, and this is just completely, I'm just gonna say it. I understand in the background that there is reluctance to do business with VTEL. Um, but I think again, that any provider in the state should be considered to help us solve this emergency set of issues that we have. So therein ends my um, testimony. And I just wanted to offer it to you as you make your way through some of these thorny and sometimes intractable issues. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Lauren Glenn? Okay. I am not seeing any, so thank you for coming in on this warm afternoon to talk to us. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you.